Good morning. Uh, I'll call this meeting to order. It's the regularly scheduled meeting of the Transportation and Public Works Committee. Uh, this day, March 13th, 2018. Uh, I'm Chair Reich. I will be uh, proceeding with today's agenda, joined by my colleagues, Council Members Johnson, Bender, and Gordon. We are a quorum, and we'll proceed with our 10 items. Uh, we have discussion items, public hearings, and consent items. I'll go through the consent items first. Any committee member can pull them for further consideration if they wish. Uh, item, uh, the first consent item, item four, is the Brooklyn Boulevard Reconstruction Project, and that's a cooperative agreement with the City of Brooklyn Center. Item five is the request for proposals for industrial electrical engineering planning, design, and construction services. Uh, item six is the contract with Metro Transit for Route 5 transit signal priority. Item seven is the Metropolitan Council of Environmental Services water reuse related amendments to the water resources planning. Uh, and these are comments uh, from our staff. Item eight is the bid for Fiddley Campus Sanitary Sewer Improvements, and that's accepting the low bid. Um, does anyone wish to pull an item for consideration? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Dissenting name. Those items will forward to full council. We'll now go into the public hearing, starting with item one, which is the Mid-City Industrial Street Reconstruction Project. Uh, good morning, Director Hutchinson. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Adam Hayo with Transportation Engineering and Design will be presenting information on the Mid-City Industrial Street Reconstruction Project for project approval, assessment, and area way abandonment. Thank Mr. you. Adam. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, today I'm here presenting for the public hearing for the Mid-City Industrial Reconstruction Project, uh, city project number 2292. Uh, the Mid-City Industrial Project was identified for reconstruction uh, due to aging infrastructure uh, poor pavement conditions, and a lack of pedestrian facilities. Uh, City Council provided layout approval for the Mid-City Industrial Project on November 3rd of 2017. Prior to layout approval, City staff conducted numerous outreach activities throughout the planning and design of the project. Um, there was three meetings held at the Mid-City Industrial Business Association, as well as an open house. Um, furthermore, uh, City staff conducted individual meetings with numerous property owners and property managers. During the design, Public Works was guided by the city and state design guidelines, such as Access Minneapolis and State Aid Design Manual, to make recommendations uh, tailored to the context of the Mid-City project area. The design incorporated the need for pedestrian facilities due to the large sidewalk gaps in the area. Uh, new sidewalk improvements uh, improve access for all users, expands transportation options in the area, and facilitates better connectivity to and from transit service provided by Metro Transit within the project area. Um, understanding the mixed use nature of this area, city staff identified opportunities for greening along the project corridor. And finally, city staff evaluated the operational use of each street segment uh, in order to ensure access to individual businesses. Uh, this involved turning movements in and out of all commercial driveways. Uh, with that, the proposed project consists of reconstructing approximately 2.2 miles of streets in the Mid-City Industrial Area, uh, located in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, the project includes Arthur Street Northeast, uh, Cleveland Street Northeast, Hoover Street Northeast, Kennedy Street Northeast, R Street Northeast, Taft Street Northeast, and uh, Traffic Street Northeast, excuse me, and finally Winter Street Northeast. As you can see, a lot of street segments in this area. Uh, the elements of the project include new sidewalks, ADA compliant curb ramps, new pavement with curbing gutter, and utility improvements. The project will also inc include some boulevard trees, signal improvement, and signage. Uh, the total project cost is $22.2 million. Uh, the total street re reconstruction assessment for the Mitzi Industrial Reconstruction Project is $7,344,268. This is based on our 2018 uniform assessment rates. Uh, the, rest, the rest of the funding sources include uh, cash transfers, net debt bonds, stormwater revenue, sanitary revenue, and water revenue. Uh, with that, in, in advance of today's public hearings, city staff uh, hosted a pre-assessment meeting to provide an overview of the project, discuss plan improvements, and answer any questions related to assessment method and process. This meeting was held on March 5th. Today, public hearing is asking city council to pass resolutions ordering the work to proceed adopting the special assessments, authorizing the sale of assessment bonds, and authorizing abandonment and removal of areaways in conflict with the project. With that, I conclude my presentation. I'll stand by for any questions. Um, are there any questions per the staff presentation? I see none. I will then open the public hearing, and this is public hearing for item number one, Mid-City Industrial. 
Uh, we do have people who signed in. I will go in order. Uh, if you can come forward and state your name and address for the record, starting with uh, Mr. Charlie Nestor. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Nestor. I'm uh, with Hillcrest Development, 2424 Kennedy Street Northeast. Uh, we are also, I'm also the representative for the adjacent parcels uh, at, excuse me, 40, 441 Stinson and 451 Stinson, which is Zacchaeus Deli and Empire Bakery. Uh, Hillcrest Development, we've, we've provided the objection letter uh, to protect our rights going forward. Our attorney, of course, put in their various language uh, regarding uh, the assessment. I guess I'm here to really to speak in terms of uh, uh, we appreciate the process that uh, Public Works has gone through. Uh, as a longtime property owner and developer in Northeast Minneapolis, at one time we, we pretty much touched every building that is being assessed here. Uh, we put in most of the infrastructure, most of the sidewalks over the last few years. Uh, and uh, our, our biggest concern is that the value that we placed at our properties in question uh, has not been addressed or reflected in the assessment. But we do have sidewalks. We've updated sidewalks. We've updated our infrastructure. Uh, we are right at the corner. Uh, we've been at all the meetings. We've expressed our, our question as to how that will be credited. And we certainly are not questioning the, the, the value of some of the improvements, we are uh, we are questioning all the the necessary uh, uh, assessment for all the improvements, and we would uh, uh, look for the uh, public works to look on a, a parcel by parcel basis. Maybe they have done so, and they've provided a different credit or valuation, but there's been no uh, supporting information to reflect that, and. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And just uh, one one last item. Uh, we Our concern here is we own a lot of other buildings. So we're working on legacy streets in Northeast. We have, uh, we're in most of the neighborhoods uh, that is represented by the council here. And and we, we know all those roads at some point are going to need to be touched. And we've done millions of dollars of infrastructure improvements to those streets. And if, if this is an example of where those those past infrastructure improvements made by the ownership are not going to be um, um, included or credited, then it's a strong concern of ours going forward. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Uh, moving down, uh, we have uh, Joel uh, Greta or Grothke. I can't quite read it. Uh, please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Good morning. Uh, Grothy. Um, I am uh, representative of API Supply Lifts. Uh, we're at 624 Arthur Street. And um, I won't, uh, Charlie, thank you for kind of addressing. I won't waste anyone's time. Uh, we've met with Adam um, back in August 2017, basically looking at all the west side operations on Arthur Street. Um, we have six driveways ingress and egress on Arthur Street. It's all industrial. There's no commercial, there's no residential. It's been operating as an industrial zone parcels as a whole for over 100 years. And yet, my concern is not the cost, because we, we will love a new street. We love a new road. We love new curbs. We love everything that you're offering. And my concern is safety. You're inviting pedestrian traffic to a heavy, heavy traffic, ingress and egress with tractor trailers. Our, our equipment is over 40,000 pounds on our beds. And you're inviting pedestrian traffic with our weather here in Minnesota, keeping those sidewalks cleared. And besides that point, our west side has all the utility poles running up and down that side. So you're going to put sidewalks in with all the utility poles and you're going to invite pedestrian traffic. I, I just, this is where common sense meets policy. That's really my point. And so I wanted to make sure that it was noted, recorded here today because it's not if an accident happens, it's just going to be when. 
And so that's really my point. I have, uh, when we gathered with Adam back in August, I had 100% opposed our whole west side. It's all signed. And so I just want to make sure that the city has noted it and that it's understood that we just believe it's just a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, it will be uh, credited to the record. Thank you. Um, moving down, we have uh, Michael Mattingly. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Mr. Chair, Council Members, Michael Mattingly. I'm here with Kay McGarren, LLC. Um, I'm an attorney who represents them. Property owner 815 Taft Street, 743 Taft Street, 801 Taft Street, and 2608 Broadway Street Northeast. Um, I think Charlie and Joel have made a lot of the points that I'd like to make related to the industrial character of the area. Um, we have a property that will definitely benefit to some degree from a level of improvements. I think that our concern is the level of assessments and the extent to which that level of assessments is disproportionate to the value that will be added to our property by some of these improvements in particular some of the pedestrian oriented improvements in an industrial oriented area we also provided a letter that stated some more detailed concerns so that's the extent of my comments i'd like to make thank you thank you uh, bill cousins please come forward and state your name and address for the record good morning um I'm Bill Cousins. I represent Marquette Properties and Pioneer Rim and Wheel Company. We're currently at uh, 2500 Kennedy Street. Um, we've been a Minneapolis-based company founded and originated here on 8th and Marquette in 1911. And um, we strongly oppose the uh, development aspects. We understand there's improvement in infrastructure, but this is an industrial area and has been an industrial area for the preceding 100 years, as Joel and Charlie have stated. The, um, our building where we currently reside was redeveloped in 1987. So we've been at the current location almost 31 years. And the infrastructure additions of pedestrian sidewalk to the east side of our building, which is a full industrial square, along with the truck traffic, as that cap is a major truck, truck route at that point, again, raises a great safety concern for us. And as stated by some of the other participants, the assessed values as compared to the, the in infrastructure value increase to the uh, main property owners in the area is uh, disproportionately in balance, I, we believe. So uh, we, we strongly suggest the city council greatly uh, take under advisement that it's, it's not in the interest of business development, this type of infrastructure addition in this area of the city. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have, that's the last one signed in. Does anyone else wish to come forward and give testimony uh, and make public statement? Anyone wish to come forward? Uh, seeing none, uh, I will close the public hearing and just ask staff to address maybe a couple uh, themes that have been popped up. One, the uh, standards by which we have our complete streets policy uh, superimposed in an industrial area. It's sort of new uh, to explain the thinking around that and, and some of the comments that were made. And then in terms of getting credits from past infrastructure work and how that plays in our assessment protocol, if at all. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess going into the first question concerning uh, Arthur Street there in terms of the sidewalk, uh, we did meet with the uh, gentleman uh, during our kind of our preliminary stage of the project and through a design. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, the, the design incorporated the need for pedestrian facilities um, due to the large sidewalk gaps in the area, currently pedestrians are walking in the street today alongside semis and large vehicles, which is a, a safety hazard for the city. Um, but in terms of uh, providing sidewalks on both sides of the street, it's um, city practice to provide, you know, unless there's any right-of-way constraints or any engineering constraints, we try to provide, based on Access Minneapolis, our city policies to provide sidewalk on both sides of the street. Um, as for the assessment question, um, we follow the city policy for applying assessments, uh, which is based on the square footage of the individual lots uh, multiplied by the uni uniform assessment rate. And there's an option for paying it over 20 years um, through the property tax, so that's a potential option if they can pay it all at once. And as for 
Um, for this location, it's more of an industrial area, so we're using the non-residential rate, which is a higher rate compared to the residential rate. Um, and the steps, as I mentioned, um, other factors would be, uh, as I mentioned, size, and more specifically, the size of the property within the influence area of the project. Generally, uh, with a larger property area, you'll have a, a larger amount for assessments. And with that, I might, any Matt may add anything about that? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Matt Hannon. I'm with the uh, Special Assessments and Right-of-Way Office. Um, I guess the only thing I would add to that is because we're, the assessments are, are calculated uh, based on the uniform assessment rates and not the value of the project, whether the sidewalk is included or additional infrastructure is added, it doesn't impact, um, it doesn't affect the amount that each property owner will be assessed. That's a good clarification, thank you. Um, any other questions for the dialogue we've had in the public hearing? Um, seeing none, I think all the comments were registered. Um, obviously, one of the key things to make a defensible uh, argument is consistency, so our, uni our uniform assessment rate, I think, achieves that, that uh, standard. Uh, and then, of course, any question about the valuation per the assessment, that can be uh, meted out probably through the appeals process, which would be open to anyone who registered a complaint today. Um, with that, if there's no further discussion, um, I would move the item as submitted by staff. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Dissenting nay. Thank you. Uh, we now can move to item two, uh, which is the Nokomis Area Residential Street Resurfacing Project Approval and Assessment. <laughs> Director Hutchinson. Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to introduce Mike Kennedy, the Director of uh, Transportation Maintenance and Repair, to talk about the Nokomis Area Residential Street Resurfacing project, project approval and assessment. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <clears throat> Mike Kennedy, I'm the Director of Transportation Maintenance and Repair for Public Works. We're here today to start what will be a long parade of resurfacing projects that will uh, come before you for the public hearings. Um, <clears throat> on February 9th, 2018, the City Council designated the location streets and improvements proposed to be made in the 2017 street resurfacing program. The Comus residential area was included in that designation. The Nakotas Nokomis uh, Area Residential pro or Project is bounded by East Minnehaha Parkway on the north, 40th Avenue South on the south on the east, 54th Street East on the south, and 34th Avenue South on the west. That's a tongue twister. And are all local city streets. This area was last paved in 1985. The project streets are anticipated to be resurfaced in the spring of 2018. The cost estimate of $1,108,343 for this project consists of 162717 in net debt bonds and 945626 in special assessments. The proposed street resurfacing program uh, was uh, special assessment rates were determined by applying the 2018 uniform assessment rates to the land area of the benefited parcels within the street influence zone, the 2018 resurfacing rates are 65 cents per square foot for non-residential and 22 cents per square foot for residential. We did have a um, pre-public hearing meeting, a community meeting, and uh, we had some oh, 20, looks like 24 attendees out of about 720 invitations mailed, um, <clears throat> and that was held. So today we are here to recommend passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $945,626.23 for the Nokomis Area Project uh, and passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance of, sale, of the sale of assessment bonds in the aforesaid amount. Um, with that, I, we're here to take questions. And that's the end of my presentation for the moment. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I uh, have received a question from a number of residents around 34th Avenue uh, reconstruction that's coming up. I know that's been pushed back a year. Uh, the concern is that trucks may end up, uh, either construction trucks or even detours may end up routing over this newly paved road and ultimately wear down or damage it in some way. Can you uh, comment on that and explain where the trucks might route and where detours might be for 34th Avenue, but how uh, these two relate? 
Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Councilmember Jessen, that's a very good question. I'm glad people are asking that. If you look on the map, um, you'll notice that, yes, 34th Avenue South is the uh, westernmost boundary. Um, <clears throat> also, 50th Street East and 54th Street East are not part of the project of, at this time. Those are both MSA streets. The um, construction traffic for 34th Avenue South will enter from the north and south on 34th Avenue, it will not go into the project, or they may come across the project, but on 50th Street and 54th Street only. So they will be directed not to go on our new pavement and stay out of those residential streets. So that should not affect um, this project at all. And do you know where traffic for the local area will be detoured? Is that going to be similar, that they'll be up uh, to either 50th Street or Minnehaha Parkway or 54th Street? Uh, Councilmember uh, Reich, or, uh, Chair Reich and Councilmember Johnson, I don't know the details of that. However, access will be maintained for the folks. Um, they, they should be able to get into any part of the neighborhood as, as needed. I appreciate uh, you touching on that, and I hope that, and I'll continue working with our uh, project team on 34th Avenue uh, reconstruction uh, to just make sure that we're not detouring local traffic over the newly paved roads and putting uh, particularly high volumes right after they've been uh, resurfaced. We have that same interest. Thank you. Any other questions per the presentation? Uh, seeing none, uh, I will then open the public hearing. This is public hearing number two, the Nokomis Area Residential Street Resurfacing Project. Uh, we do have people signed in. I will take them in order. If you can come forward and state your name and address for the record, beginning with Keith Olson. Good morning, my name is Keith Olson, uh, 4912 36 Avenue South. Um, I'm not opposed to the project, I'm opposed to the timing of it. We were told the same thing when they did East 50th a few years ago that the truck traffic wouldn't come through. They came through the neighborhood, they damaged the streets, nothing got fixed. Them construction trucks hauling concrete are going to have to come. That's just life. The trucks have to move around. Um, if we delay this a year, I don't know when you said, you say 34th is being de delayed now? It should be after 34th so that we can put in a new street and be done with it. Um, I don't want to bill for a new street and, ha and it's damaged by the truck traffic off of 34th because you're going to get into an issue. I didn't pay for a damaged street. I want a new street. If we delay it, get 34th done, because that thing is way worse than 36, 34th album. It's far more damaged in the neighborhood. But that traffic is going to come in the neighborhood. There's nothing you can do about it. The construction is going to come in the neighborhood, and they say they'll come back and patch if there's a problem. I didn't pay for a patch. I paid for a nice street, and it'll probably never happen again in my life, and I've been there all my life. So I just want it to last. I want to pay for a new street, not a stamp street that got damaged or patched. So I think by delaying it is a better way. I don't know. We need it, but uh, we don't want it ruined either. Point well taken. Okay. Thank you. Um, Harold Weiss, <clears throat> please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Good morning, committee. Thank you. And it's nice to see Andrew here today, our council men member in our area. Um, I, I'm here because uh, I want to say that we really need this, and I appreciate that we have this new program that's going to address our streets in Minneapolis, and I'm glad that we're kind of on the top of the list. So um, no one likes bumps in their street or humps and holes. Uh, we got a bunch of them now, and I hope they get out soon and start patching them. Um, but speaking of bumps and holes, uh, I just want to address an issue that's been really a sore spot for me, and I've talked to Andrew about it many times, and that would be speed bumps, and I'd like to see a moratorium on speed bumps in Minneapolis, and they're going to be taken out now when they do the street, and we have a couple on 39th Avenue, and <clears throat> I really don't feel there's any need for it. I've lived in my home on 39th Avenue where the speed bumps are since 1970, and um, some people will say there's all kinds of pedestrian traffic in that one block where five people live that paid to have those on. Um, those speed bumps in, in place, and I don't think there's that much pedestrian traffic there at all. Maybe on the weekend you might see see someone crossing the road with a canoe or something to get in or out of the creek, and uh, sometimes there may be a child sliding on the little hill there, but it's so infrequent, and I just think those people kind of feel like they're privileged in that one block, and all the neighbors that I talk to, and I'm a block club leader, and I'm very active in the community, 
they don't like speed bumps. When they get taken out, I'd like to work with somebody to see if we can't get rid of them, and uh, ma mainly because I don't think they're necessary. Any questions of me? No, thanks for the comment, and, and we will uh, t touch staff after all the testimony regarding the speed bump issue. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Rico uh, Senin. Please state your name Mr. and address Chair. for the record. Thank you, Committee. Uh, my name is Rico, Rico Senin. Uh, my wife and I have owned our property on 39th Avenue South uh, since 1992. I was at the meeting uh, back on about a week ago, March 6th, and I think there were a lot of irate, irate people at the meeting, uh, irate for a number of reasons. First of all, there was uh, very little notice given. We received a letter two, uh, two weeks prior to it saying, I think the word uh, used was that there was a meeting to be held where you could bring your questions, and uh, and uh, the meeting was for the consideration of a project to resurface the roads, the consideration. Uh, we were told at the meeting that by a public works uh, representative and by the assessor that this was just normal practice. Uh, the project would go ahead which doesn't seem to allow much room for consideration. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Mm. I think if we're going to consider, we should consider. We shouldn't just say that these projects are going to go ahead. Then my neighbor, who is a structural engineer, and myself queried why this area uh, was being chosen. And we were told in uh, a few words, there had been a three-year study on roads, that the substrata had been checked, that this was due, probably is. Um, however, our road is in pretty good condition, 39th Avenue South. It's not as bad as some of the others. However, as we probed into these engineering studies and how we could get some knowledge of them, we found out that it wasn't engineering studies. It was something that these were the exact same plats that have been done in 1985. So this is just, hey, we're starting resurfacing and we're going to do what we did in 1985 and choose the exact same plats. And uh, so that's the extent of the engineering studies, I guess. So I'd like to register that as a point of consideration. Um, the other thing is that the big question that came up was truck traffic. There's a, um, a small commercial area uh, right there between 50th and uh, about 53rd on 34th. And there's a lot of truck traffic, in particular the liquor store and the uh, local uh, grocery store uh, have truck traffic that comes right off 31st. In fact, they come around on 35th and 51st, if you look at your map. They typically do that. So does the city. Uh, uh, snow trucks and snow removal equipment trucks all park there because there's a well, uh, there's a, a Super America there and that's where they grab their breaks and their lunch. So uh, you know, I, I listened to the director saying that all traffic will be rerouted. I don't see it being rerouted now that they are using the streets. They will use these streets. And my other concern and the concern of those people, there were about 35 of them, by the way, at that meeting. Uh, some didn't sign in. They came late. But the concern is that we'll do this resurfacing job, and then we'll do this reconstruction job, and we'll do them the same year. Why are we doing that? So I'm opposed to it, because I think we should delay for at least a year. Let's do one. Let's do it right. Let's get the main thoroughfare done. And then let's come back next year and do the other stuff. That's, that's where I'm at, and I think where most of my neighbors are at. I think it's fair, and it's practical, and I think it makes sense. So that's it. Any questions? No. no. Uh, thank you for the comments. And we'll have thank staff you. address the issues raised. Thank you. Um, that's it for who signed in. Anyone else signed in subsequently? Anyone wish to come forward uh, and make testimony or comment? Um, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Um, I guess the key things that came up were the timing between the reconstruction project and the resurfacing, speed bumps and how we treat them uh, with a project moving forward. And then the consideration uh, regarding why this patch, is it a coincidence that it was done in 85, or it just so happens that 
the condition speaks for itself. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm um, to um, several questions about the construction traffic, and I did try to address that earlier, but I want to reinforce the fact that um, we're going to ensure that construction traffic doesn't come in onto the new streets. Um, <clears throat> the last gentleman talked about local business traffic. We're not going to reroute those or anything like that. That's still part of of, uh, of the traffic flow in the area. Um, the uh, Part of the reason that those businesses are assessed at a higher rate is because they do generate more more traffic, more heavy traffic and things like that. So they are they are assessed at a, at a higher rate than the normal residential areas and the or properties. Um, but we, we believe that this is the right time to do both of these projects. Um, <clears throat> uh, there aren't necessarily very rigorous um, uh, pavement studies that are done on our residential programs. This is about, and this I've heard the term new streets here um, by a couple of the folks. These aren't new streets. This is new pavement. This is an overlay process. The, um, the idea of the, of the work here isn't to create a new street. We're not doing curb and gutter. We're not doing uh, extraordinary work. We're simply trying to extend the life cycle of the streets. The street, uh, these, this project, this neighborhood project was built in 1985. So in general, the streets there are all the same age. They have all had the same work history on them uh, with a couple of successive seal coats in the past, the last one being in 1995. And in general, while it's not exact, uh, in general, the streets have sort of aged and they're in the same condition. And so when we um, when we look at our resurfacing program and many of our reconstruction projects, we look at those original pavement conditions with the assumption that in general, those streets are, are all in sort of the same condition. And it's easier for us to program projects by using the old limits, the old paving construction limits. Same with um, many of, of our arterial streets like 34th, we're looking at uh, most of that section was built at about the same time, and age at the same time. And so that's how they are, are uh, uh, put into the program. Um, this project, um, what we do use is, uh, for a technical um, uh, look, is we use our pavement condition index that gives some indication of where the street is, streets are in its life cycle, the aggregate pavement condition in, index for the neighborhood and this uh, the Comos project is 36 to 40. It was last rated in about, um, uh, I think it was 1990, uh, 2015. So it's a fairly recent condition index. That condition index is from zero to 100. And so this is a fairly low condition index and it indicates that it is at the exact right time to do this sort of resurfacing work to extend life cycle. Um, our assessments are one fourth the cost of a new new street uh, reconstruction rate. And so what we're trying to do here is um, uh, apply this, this treatment to extend the life of the street longer so we don't have to come back for a number of years. You won't have to see, you won't see potholes for a number of years. Um, the street department won't be in having to do um, miscellaneous repairs. <clears throat> and, and to come in and do the full reconstruction of those streets uh, won't have to happen for years by doing this intermediate treatment. So this project is right in line. It's it's the perfect time to do this in its life cycle. It's the right time to do the 34th Avenue reconstruction. It's very common that, that we have uh, construction projects adjacent to our resurfacing projects and we can um, uh, make that work, coordinate the work and effort and all the construction traffic between them to uh, stay off of each other and, and not conflict. Thank you. And then regarding the matter of speed bumps, is there a whole policy guidance around that? <clears throat> um, the, the installation and the need for the speed humps can be looked at by our traffic division. They manage those. We'd be happy to pull them into the equation. Um, <clears throat> if there are uh, speed humps and other things within projects when we service them, we will replace them in kind with no extra cost to the property owners. Um, if there is a desire to, if something has changed that has uh, changed the original condition and, and desire for those speed humps, uh, our traffic department can look at those and they can be removed if that's what the, the uh, will of the neighborhood is in working with the council member. Thank you. Appreciate those clarifications. Um, Ma'am, did you, were you motioning to speak on number two? Um, yes. Um, sorry. Yeah, state your name and address for the record. Uh, uh, my name's Jarris Heckler and I live at 4940 36th Avenue. This is a new property for me. Well, I've never owned a house before, but anyway, my neighbor and I were talking and we are 
we both wrote little letters that uh, we were concerned about what um, the previous three gentlemen talked about, about that we are paying these assessments and then the 34th project will be done after and will it break up our streets? And, you know, I want to be a good citizen, but I also really want it to be in a timely manner so that it all is cohesive and that we don't have broken up streets for years afterwards. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Is there somewhere I could put these two letters? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. And when I also wish to testify, uh, seeing none, um, I will close the public hearing and open up the questions for Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I really appreciate uh, my constituents bringing forward these concerns about uh, 34th Avenue and uh, the potential impact from the construction. And I uh, just want to reaffirm my commitment to working with Public Works on that. And uh, even if there's ways, for instance, that we could uh, stage, I know when we've done these projects like Minnehaha Avenue reconstruction, Nawadaha, that uh, we stage barricades in a way that local uh, cars or vehicles can get through, but basically larger vehicles are unable to uh, skirt through. And that way it can really force uh, those construction trucks up to streets that haven't recently uh, been repaved. So I, I definitely uh, will be working closely with staff on that. Um, and I also think working with the local businesses and having a, a plan for their traffic is certainly in scope and is something that's part of 34th Avenue reconstruction and making sure that um, it doesn't cause unusual detours that put extra strain on the road. Um, I do appreciate though that this is a, a poor condition street and needs to get done and frankly uh, while I agree with the comment that you know I personally Thinks it, they think it makes more sense to do 34th Avenue South first and then this repaving. We also have some unforeseen aspects that have come into play with 34th Avenue South, uh, specifically with the storm, uh, uh, storm water system and uh, the sewer system and it's requiring additional work and that's what's caused this delay in the project. So the concern is that if we push off this repaving, we're gonna end up risking potentially this turning into a full reconstruction, which then is not one fourth the cost, it's four times the cost for residents in terms of assessment, as well as uh, causes other issues by pushing around projects in our timeline on things. So uh, I do agree it would make sense to flip the two, but unfortunately I don't think that's really possible at this point. I do have a question though, Mr. Chair, um, that another constituent had written about uh, and it's really related with assessments. And I'm just wondering if staff would be able to answer this question. If a constituent has a particular hardship financially uh, and they're concerned about uh, the payment uh, plan option, adding interest on and ultimately being more expensive, uh, is there any way or special ability to just get based off of their financial hardship, the full payment option postponed by one year so rather than December 2018, that they could do December 2019 and do a full payment uh, for their assessment. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Johnson, I'm not aware of that possibility to have one person delay. Um, typically, this all has to go to Hennepin County and it's put forward. I, I, I am familiar with the questions of that gentleman. Um, the, the reason we charge the interest, and number one, it's simple interest. It's not compound interest, so it's not as bad as is, is it might be um, <clears throat> the rate that we apply. We sell assessment bonds um, to do this work. The rate that we apply to the assessments is the same that the city um, has to pay for those assessments bonds. So that's why um, there is the interest on there. Um, <clears throat> they can stretch their payments out over time, which would, you know, uh, kind of hope to phrase some of that. There are programs where people can um, who are 65 or older can um, uh, have deferments of the special assessments. I don't know if that would qualify in this case, but if it does, then we can talk about that with that individual as well. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments? Uh, seeing none, um, I will uh, move this item as submitted. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Dissenting nay, that carries. And we'll now move to our final public hearing, item three, Plymouth Avenue Street Resurfacing. Director Hutchinson. 
I'm going to just here. have uh, Mike Kennedy stay right where he is. And keep All right. Going. Again, Mike Kennedy from Public Works. Um, this is uh, our second resurfacing project public hearing for today. And I have to find the right notes here. Apologize for the delay here. Just got a little too much in the folders here. <clears throat> this public hearing is for the Plymouth, Ad Plymouth Avenue North Street resurfacing. In, on February 9th of 2018, the City Council designated the location streets and improvements proposed to be made in the 2017 Street Resurfacing Program, and Plymouth Avenue North was also included in this designation. Plymouth Avenue North, as you can see on the project map, is uh, from Penn Avenue North to Lindale Avenue North, and this is a municipal state aid street. This street segment was last paved in 1981. The project street is anticipated to resurface in the sum sometime mid-summer of 2018. The resurfacing program uh, or the cost estimate for this project is $518,226, uh, of which uh, $161,516 $161, is of net debt bonds and the remainder in special assessments. Once again, the special assessments were um, uh, determined by applying the 2018 uniform assessment rates. Uh, we did have a, a, a neighborhood meeting, pre-public hearing. I think there were only two people that attended that. Uh, so today, again, we recommend the passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $356,710.33 for the Plymouth Avenue North project and passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount uh, that is stated. So that's my presentation. I can take questions if needed. Any questions per the staff presentation? See none. I will open the public hearing. Anyone sign in? No one signed in. Does anyone wish to come forward and make comment? Does anyone wish to come forward and make comment on this project? See none. I will close the public hearing. And if there's no further questions for staff, I'll move the item as submitted. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Senti nay. That carries. We have now completed our public hearing section. We now can move to our two discussion items, beginning with discussion item number nine. And this is a just a good time of the year. We get to do this every year, and it's a, one of the uh, better parts of our agenda, which is our advisory committees for pedestrians and bicycles giving their report. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I am very pleased to introduce Matthew Durdall a transportation planner and the city's bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for the city of Minneapolis who has done great work to advance both biking and walking in the city of Minneapolis and he's done so by working in partnership with our committees, the Bicycle Advisory Committee and the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Before Matthew starts talking, I want to take a moment and thank the committees for their time volunteering to support our work. So being here today and uh, making this presentation, giving the update, and for everything that you are doing on your committees, all the meetings you attend, all the work you do in the community, thank you very much from Public Works. And here's Matthew. <laughs> Morning, Mr. Dirdall. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, um, my name is Matthew Dirdall. I'm the Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator um, for the City of Minneapolis Transportation and Planning and Programming Division of Public Works. Um, I'm very excited about this agenda item, something that we look forward to um, every year. Um, the purpose of this is, um, the, I guess the technical purpose of this, is to receive and file the 2017 Pedestrian Advisory Committee and Bicycle Advisory Committee annual reports. Um, and more important than that, it's an opportunity to hear from the committee members, um, in this case the two chairs of the committee. I also want to recognize other members that are in the crowd today, so Neil Baxter, Joshua Hodak, uh, Peter Vader, where's Peter, right there. Um, and Matthew Hendricks, um, and then Suzanne Murphy, um, council aide uh, for the PAC, um, so represents the council um, on the PAC, and then Julia Curran, um, thank you, um, as well. And Georgiana? Oh, Georgiana Yantos, people um, snuck in. Uh, thanks for coming. 
Um, so it's an opportunity for us as well to thank the um, committee for their work. Uh, they um, give countless hours um, throughout the year uh, to advise the city on pedestrian and walking issues. Since it's a new council this year, um, I want to start with an overview of the PAC and BAC. Uh, so this is a picture of the National Walking Summit, which was held in the Twin Cities, we'll say. It was technically in St. Paul, but there's a big Minneapolis um, contingent there as well. And the Pedestrian Advisory Committee sent uh, several members, um, and that was a great opportunity to share the work that we're doing in Minneapolis with um, other people across the country. Basic overview of the PAC and BAC. Uh, the role of the BAC and PAC is to advise the mayor, city council, and public works on walking and biking issues. Um, it also often um, spills over into Hennepin County and MnDOT and Park Board uh, work as well. The PAC is made up of 15 at-large members, um, so not ward specific, but rather um, 15 um, at-large members. And we look for a geogra geographic balance across the city um, through that. The BAC is structured a little differently. Um, there's one member per city council ward, and then three at-large members that um, are appointed by the Park and Recreation Board. And then both committees have agency uh, partners that are on the committee um, and show up every month. And I think that's a great um, part of the BAC PAC because it gives uh, the members a chance to interact with staff from all these different agencies and city departments um, rather than having to um, ask me to go coordinate and come back. Um, so that's a great uh, part of the committee. So each committee also has one full meeting each month and then two subcommittees. There's the engineering subcommittee, which primarily um, is made up of projects that are brought to the committee um, through Minneapolis Public Works, Hennepin County, Park Board, and MnDOT. Um, and then there's the non-infrastructure committees. On the BAC, it's called the 5E um, subcommittee. And on the PAC, it's called Programs and Policies. And that's an opportunity for the committees to engage in non-infrastructure work related to walking and biking. There are links there to the Pedestrian Advisory Committee and Bicycle Advisory Committee websites. I encourage you to check those websites out. Um, you can see all of the agendas, minutes, and resolutions um, posted on there. So big picture, uh, the PAC and BAC have been with us over the years on a lot of really important policy and infrastructure change. Um, some of those include uh, the development of Access Minneapolis, open streets, uh, recent new walking, biking capital improvement programs, uh, including our Protect Bikeway program, uh, Sidewalk App program, Safe Routes to School and others, our Complete Streets policy, and then uh, recently a pedestrian crash study. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the chairs of the PAC and the BAC. And uh, this year, they, they combine their presentations a little bit more than in the past. So you're not going to hear um, specifically about walking from Julia and about biking from Nick. Uh, they've sort of combined that. And I think that's sort of representative of the PAC and BAC working together because issues related to walking and biking are, are common. So first, I'll introduce Nick Mason the chair of the BAC, and after that, Julia Tabbitt, chair of the PAC. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nick Mason. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be back here again, uh, providing this annual report and uh, an honor to serve Ward 12 and uh, get to serve as chair uh, of this great committee that I really enjoy. Um, and I also wanted to say I've, I've done this more than once now, and um, I'm really happy to be here in partnership with the BAC and Julia and have our committees working together uh, more frequently. So uh, really quickly, I uh, want to say thank you to the council for supporting and prioritizing walking and biking in all the ways that our city needs to do. Um, as usual, we've been busy. We have, we don't just sit at our meetings, we pass a lot of resolutions. Um, maybe next year we'll shoot to break 100, maybe not. Um, but but it's, a, it's a lot if you think about um, each committee only having a meeting every month, we get a lot of work done, um, and that doesn't include all the things that didn't become formal resolutions. Our committees uh, work really hard and put a lot of time in, as you can see there, 
Uh, you have more than a full-time person uh, represented conservatively between our work. Um, and as chairs, we take that really seriously and do our best to thank all of those who put that time, energy, and effort in. Well, uh, there's a brief overview of some highlights uh, from the work that we've been involved in in both committees. So we have had more complete streets in 2017 than we've ever had, including our first winter complete streets. This is a picture uh, from the Minnehaha Avenue event and one that the Bicycle Advisory Committee was uh, very much involved in doing our Behind the Big Wheel uh, public education event. So we teach people about the blind spots in large commercial vehicles. We had different partners from the BAC uh, involved in that and show people how to safely ride their bikes around commercial vehicles. We also completed uh, the pedestrian crash study, which is the most comprehensive document of its kind the city's ever done. Uh, and I think we're most excited that uh, the work from this is gonna help us prioritize the most dangerous places and create safety and access uh, for more of our pedestrian community. Really excited about this. I can't believe the number is more than 90% of our crosswalks were restriped last year. Huge number, more than 3,000. So that they're a lot more visible to everyone, especially motorists, so that they're hopefully looking more for pedestrians wherever they're crossing. Uh, we had installed a temporary uh, median in Johnson Street and 22nd Northeast uh, that was along a bike boulevard and provided safe crossing for pedestrians as well. It was a success and in 2017, it was turned into a permanent median, which is a big improvement and we're happy to see that there. Uh, also a coordinated effort on our Third Avenue uh, protected bike lanes, working with MnDOT, carrying those protected bike lanes uh, across the bridge and in doing so also narrowing travel lanes in hopes to reduce vehicle speed, making it safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. To many people, this will seem like a boring slide, but to those of us nerds on the committee, we're really excited about the fact that uh, the plans that we've worked on years ago uh, are efficiently and effectively spending tax dollars so that if we have um, a corridor identified, we can actually just provide that striping and provide a bicycle facility at almost no additional cost. Um, so these are an example of that on 8th Street Southeast. And uh, in, my, in my day job, I always say this, that if we're gonna focus all of our work on biking and walking somewhere, if we had to, it would be on our, on our youth and on our schools. And so it's really exciting to see capital funding for Safe Routes to School. And this is an example of one of those projects at one of our most active biking and walking schools uh, near Seward Montessori. And of course, uh, having more multi-use facilities and protected bike lanes, uh, an example of that uh, paving and renovation project is on 26th Avenue North. Now to looking ahead, Julian. Thank you all for having us and thank you, Nick, for covering all of that. That's some of what we've been up to this past year and the progress just keeps rolling along or stepping as would be my preference. So we both committees have some specifics of things that we're already working toward for this year and beyond. Um, specifically, we're really glad to have some increased funding for pedestrian focused improvements in the city budget. And we're really looking forward to seeing that money well spent, including on improved crossings and intersections, as well as adding sidewalks in many places where there currently are none. Um, the Bicycle Advisory Committee is similarly enthusiastic about upcoming improvements to bikeway infrastructure, including concrete curbs, medians, and planters, where once there was only bollards and paint. So both committees are also hoping to see more innovation in our streets. Um, we can often envision how an intersection could be improved, and temporary treatments like those shown here are an effective way to make those benefits real to other people. It would be great to give more people with good ideas a way to try them out without the full investment of concrete. And we see these sort of temporary treatments as a possible way to do that. I know that in my own neighborhood in Prospect Park, there are a lot of irregular intersections and many of my neighbors are pushing for more of those to be made safer. And I keep wishing that we could offer them an application to public works for approval for posts and paint. This more bicycle specific example is quite a bit more permanent, 
but it demonstrates the same spirit of experimentation that we'd like to see more of, including protected intersections and floating bus stop designs. Um, Nick's ideas about bike share are actually so innovative that we didn't even have a chance to talk about them yet. So I'm gonna give the floor back to him for a moment. Um, I've been involved in uh, bike share somehow. I got lucky, uh, cursed to be involved since the Republican National Convention was here and we we're testing this out as one of the first two communities in, America, in the United States uh, to work on bike share. And I can say with honesty that it has never been changing and moving faster than it is today. In my day job, I have com rural communities that are smaller ask me for advice on what they should do with bike share. And I say, I'm gonna give you some advice that's gonna be good for at least 15 minutes um, until everything changes. And um, I just got to go to the National Bike Summit in Washington, DC and see how their system that is very close to ours is interacting with new dockless bike share. And I just wanted to say, um, we're really fortunate to have a bike share provider and nice ride as a partner doing so much of the timely work that needs to be done uh, to think about our future. But I also think that should not preclude our city from uh, thinking really intensely and working on ideas around right of way, around regulations and around policies that will ensure that our vision and values uh, are upheld and that I think some cities are really excited about this, what we're currently seeing as dockless bike share funded by venture capital and really cheap rides to get things started. Um, and that those are very shiny objects and in some places they're working better than others. But I think that uh, we are and we should continue to put our vision and values first as we do this and do this right um, and continue to watch it. And the BAC is committed to working with the city on that issue. So as excited we are about some of these more specific things, we're much more invested in the bigger picture in creating a city where everyone can get where they're going, regardless of their age, financial means, or physical ability. But too often it feels like the convenience of those driving has been given priority over even the lives of anyone moving along outside of them. In the Complete Streets Policy, the Vision Zero Action Plan, and an Improved Comprehensive Winter Maintenance Plan, if they're all implemented thoughtfully, could work together to really shift that balance in favor of health, in favor of better environmental sustainability, in favor of equity and community, and the original instinctive way that humans move. And I'm here speaking for myself, of course, but even more so out of concern for those for whom, whether because of uh, physical or financial limitations, walking or biking for transportation is a necessity rather than a choice. So if we move Minneapolis forward with those folks at the forefront, everyone will benefit. So the complete streets policy is definitely intended to do that. It clearly places those walking and those using assistive mobility devices as the first priority when designing streets and public spaces. This policy is excellent and we're thrilled about it, but we have yet to see it implemented to its full extent. The both of our committees are pushing for more effective implementation with every policy and project that we discuss, and we really appreciate your continued support. Similarly, we're really, really excited to get started on Vision Zero which is a multidisciplinary uh, action planning process that says that there, zero uh, is the only acceptable number of traffic deaths on our streets. Uh, to get there, we need to prioritize our most vulnerable users, but we also need to ensure that our Vision Zero work engages and supports all members of our community, regardless of their age, affiliations, income, or skin color. And I think that we have an opportunity um, to invest and do this right, and I think we will. So a more comprehensive winter maintenance plan could also benefit the most vulnerable users. It could finally offer those walking and biking, those pushing wheelchairs or strollers or grocery carts, the same considerations that are given to those who choose to drive in the snow. And it's worth noting actually, while I have this up here, that everybody who worked on this presentation were so invested in winter maintenance that like nobody could agree on which picture to use. <laughs> there are so many good ones that prove our points. Here's Nick's. I think um, we often have to stop and, and wonder what we're fighting for and what we're working for. And I'm 
fortunate enough to be the father of three children, and I get to share a little story that I experienced this winter. Um, it was a really, really cold day in February. The wind chill was 17 below. Uh, when it's warmer, we usually walk or bike to school, and my preschooler really wanted to walk to school that day. And I said, are you sure? Are you really sure you want to walk? It's really cold out. Yes, of course. You know what five-year-olds are like. Um, and so we decided to walk to school that day, which was great, and I thought that was a little parenting win in and of itself. Um, but we were on our way to school, and there's all this snow. Most of the route had been cleared, um, and he asked me a question. Uh, he was looking at the snow that was built up in the wide street next to our narrow sidewalk, uh, and he said, Dad, is that street, is that space over there for cars or for the sidewalk? And I said, it's for cars, and he said, that is not fair that more space is for cars than for sidewalks. And my heart stopped for a moment because I was very proud that I did not feed him this information. Um, and I had to stop uh, and freeze my hands and take a picture of it and remember it. But what it reminded me is that even the youngest members of our community understand the value of public space and what we uh, are doing with it. And that we must continue to write, pass, and implement great policies and plans like Complete Streets and Vision Zero. We must complete this winter maintenance study that's underway, and we must carefully and thoughtfully plan, design, fund, and maintain our streets, which are our largest public spaces, so that all members of our community can have easy and safe access to move throughout it. And on that note, vacancies are coming. So um, some folks uh, will be coming back, and we have new appointments uh, up. Uh, for folks that are not returning, um, and do know that you should be expecting or anticipating or looking for visits from members of the PAC and DAC in the next month. Yeah, and I'll just say a little bit more about that. We have done individual visits from members of our committees, of our committees to individual council members, but it's been several years, and especially with so many new members, we thought it would be a good time to kind of reintroduce ourselves and reconnect around shared goals. And we're gonna be doing our best to coordinate between our committees so that you can just have one meeting with both of us. So be on the lookout for some sort of joint contact from us. And in the meantime, are there any questions? Are there any questions for the presentation? Councilmember Gordon. I have a silly question, but you've got this 5E committee. Um, what's the, are there five E's actually? Is this encouragement, education? You want to share what they are? Encouragement, education, evaluation, uh, equity, and enforcement. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. And also appreciate uh, all the good work that you do. I know that all those resolutions, they mean a lot, and we check them out, and we see your positions. I think it's really admirable, too, that the two committees are reporting together, working together, even thinking about meeting with council members together. I think that's really positive. I also think, though, um, don't forget, we count on you to have your individuality and your individual priorities. And so, you know, make sure that, that when there's, um, as, as we all know, when we're competing for space on our um, right of way, um, they'll be, you know, getting along is great, but don't uh, keep advocating for what you need to advocate for. I'm not I guess afraid is what to I'm fight saying. with Nick if I need to. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> I'm afraid to fight with Julia, but I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just thank you uh, to our chairs of our uh, our uh, PAC and uh, or our Bicycle Advisory Committee and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And I just appreciate all of the work that you've done and this great presentation. And also really appreciate that winter maintenance is such a priority. I think I probably have driven our director nuts talking about it, but uh, I just know that. Uh, we can do so much more there, and I'm glad that you're uh, pushing for that as well. So thank you. Council Member Render. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just also wanted to thank so much the chairs and all of the volunteers for all of the work that you've put in. And um, over the time that you've been involved, we've seen a huge transformation in how we approach our street network. And you, your, the, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committees have been critical to pushing the city's elected leaders and staff in the direction that we see now is becoming standard practice. And I just want to emphasize that I don't think we would be where we are without the leadership of the volunteers who are coming month 
after month after month to to make sure that we're accountable. Um, and I I really appreciated you highlighting the places where, you know, all of our su successes together, but also the places where we really have room for improvement. And I think that the winter maintenance piece is just the one that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I remind myself when I'm choosing to walk or bicycle with my children um, that that a lot of my neighbors don't have a choice. And I think I've told this story before, but I was um, I was actually driving along Hennepin Avenue and I saw a mother with a child who's about the same age as my youngest, who's four, um, and she was in a wheelchair and she was trying to wrangle her four-year-old across a very dangerous and busy intersection. And the little girl was holding on to her mom's chair but I could see them and I just know how hard it is for me to wrangle my four-year-old across that similar intersection. And, and it, it is just a reminder to me that um, we have so many of our neighbors who are walking or rolling in a chair or um, using uh, mobility assistance devices because they do not have a choice. They're choosing to live in neighborhoods that are the most transit oriented and walkable because those offer the most access. But then when we don't maintain our sidewalks, um, we've eliminated mobility for so many of our neighbors and there aren't simple solutions. If there were, we would have done it by now. Um, everything we would consider has a cost or, you know, a burden on or, a, you know, we're, ask, we're either asking more of the city or of property owners. But I think it was important that you pointed out and I want to underscore that we figured out how to do it for cars and we need to figure out how to do it for people who aren't able to use cars to get around our city. So thank you. And we take that really seriously. I know we feels like we've been talking about it for a long time um, and you're probably ready to see action. And I think we're getting there. Um, so thank you so much for continuing to raise that and push that issue for us. Thank you. Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, I thought of a couple other things and I really um, am excited about when we discuss more about winter maintenance. But I thought it was interesting uh, this this morning when we had our first presentation in the public hearing and I hope some of you were here um, to hear what people were saying about sidewalks coming into their industrial area um, and I'm expecting that you think we made the right decision um, but it also kind of highlights I think a tension that still exists and it seems like since our complete streets policy has been approved and we've been pursuing this it even maybe has gotten um, exacerbated a little bit. There still is a tension in our city between what we're supposed to do on the right of way and we're, I think we, we hear it from some people even louder than we used to as we're making these improvements. Um, are we doing too much to support alternatives to the automobile and that? And so I think it's important that we at least listen to one another and, and having um, it's so clear in some people this morning that it was seems so ridiculous to put a sidewalk in the industrial area. When I walked in, in this meeting feeling like what a great accomplishment we're doing. We're finally, you know, adding sidewalks where they haven't existed. I mean, this is the, a big quest many of us have been on is to, is to finish up our sidewalk infrastructure. So um, it, there's, I guess, a lot of encouragement and education and communication that needs to go on as we keep making these inroads and, 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 and just so we're aware that you don't need to comment, but um, I think it's better if we can do it in a way where we understand one another and appreciating it rather than uh, where um, there's animosity and anger you know, towards the different modes or whatever. Thank you. Uh, any further comments? Um, I will just again extend thanks. Uh, the report was very nice, touched on a lot of great points. Uh, I, I certainly like the notion of the work ahead uh, and of course the partnership in that work between the department, the electives and, and the stuff that you do. Uh, and just noting that it's very important that dual function among the many things that you do and all the time that you put into it, that dual function that cannot be replicated uh, except for citizen activism, which is grounding the work where people are and where they're at in a real world sensibility, very powerful. And then I think as I think council member Gordon was alluding to, Who's going to be that watch person or what that group that's going to be watching the horizon and pushing towards that horizon? So grounding us and then pushing us further, I think there's, that's a unique role and you do it so, so well. So thank you very much for the report today. Uh, with that, I will um, move to receive and file that report. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Dissenting name, that carries. We can now go to our final item, discussion item number 10, Met Council's TPP. Director Hutchinson. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, 
This next presentation is an update uh, that will be introduced by Kathleen Mayo from Transportation Planning and Programming, and Kathleen will be joined by the staff of Met Council. Uh, they'll present information on the transportation policy plan that is underway now, and this is an interim report to you so that you feel um, that you can follow along with the process. So I'll turn it to Kathleen, who's going to provide uh, some additional information, and then Kathleen will invite our guests as well. Good morning, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Kathleen Mayle, uh, Supervisor, Transportation Planner in our Transportation Planning and Programming Division of Public Works. Primarily, as Robin has mentioned, I'm here to introduce the speakers today, but I did want to take a moment to just highlight the importance of the Met Council's 2040 Transportation Policy Plan and then outline the city's involvement in its production. So the Met Council is updating this year the 2015 Transportation Policy Plan. This plan sets policies based on goals and objectives for the regional transportation system and is a major component of the region's development guide, Thrive MSP 2040. The TPP update process is a collaboration between Met Council and local government agencies, and Minneapolis is involved in several ways. We're involved through our involvement, Chair Reich's involvement in the Transportation Advisory Board. Um, we're also involved as a city in the Technical Advisory Committee's Planning Subcommittee, or TAC, um, which serves as the primary technical stakeholder group reporting on the preparation of the TPP and reporting back to the TAB. And then also there's a lot of collaboration that happens at the staff level with both Public Works and CPED staff on um, different elements during the plan development process. So as um, Robin mentioned, we this is an interim update. We will be coming this summer when the draft TPP is actually released and um, released for public comment. We'll be bringing those public comments through this committee um, for your review and approval. So with that, um, I'm pleased to introduce Nick Thompson, who is the Director of Metropolitan Transportation Services at the Met Council, who will lead the presentation and introduce several other Met Council staff. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chair, Met Council members, uh, for the record, Nick Thompson from the Met Council, thank you for this opportunity to talk today. I'd also like to recognize in the audience our Council members Dorfman and Lukowski here to listen to the comments that you would have. What we have today is a presentation about the overview of the TPP, but also then we broke it down into investments in transit, highway, and bicycle networks in the region. So as time permits, we can cover all of those, but if we are short on time, we can uh, shorten that presentation about to hear what you'd like to hear on the investment plans. So stepping back a little bit, what is the TPP? It is our region's long-range transportation policy plan. It's required both by state and federal law. We as the Met Council prepare this plan and adopt this plan, but we prepare it with you and with our local partners. Uh, TAB is uh, instrumental in this process of developing this plan and, and providing input in addition to local governments, tribes, state agencies, and then regional transit providers Metro Transit, and also the suburban providers. There is an extensive public process, and I'll talk about that schedule for public participation. We are required to update this plan every four years um, and cover at least a 20-year period. This time it is an update. It is not a wholesale policy change from our current 2040 uh, transportation policy plan. It is a plan, though, that in each update, we update the regional forecast for population, jobs, household, and reasonable uh, revenue projections that the region could expect to spend on transportation. Because this is an investment plan for the region, and it must be a fiscally constrained plan, so we need updated for any changes that have occurred to financing in the region. Uh, it must demonstrate air quality conformity with the investments we have, and we are able to model that. As your city is going through your comprehensive plan update, it is important that it is utilizing the TPP, uh, but just so there's not any confusion with this, you're basing your comp plan updates on the existing TPP, which was passed and approved in 2015. There are a few exceptions where there's been some major changes that cities definitely want to reflect since 2015. Uh, so there's a, a few exceptions where they're using uh, the TPP that it will be adopted for a few elements like transit weight changes. Two important things that we want, I want to talk about in, our, in what this plan, investment plan is, is number one is the fiscal constraint plan. It's the plan for where, how we're going to spend the money in the region that we expect to have regionally. Uh, that is what our current revenue scenario is. It really assumes, to our best judgment, based on current law, reasonable projections for growth in funding sources like uh, 
invest or uh, uh, fairs or other, um, how much money would the region have and what will that money be spent on? In general, in our region, uh, as you've probably heard many times, is there's a, been a lack of investment in transportation. So we're projecting that we will, with the, on the highway side, we won't even be able to maintain our current highway network uh, so, uh, to the needs to uh, be met unless there's some changes. On the transit side, uh, our local bus network, we're able to maintain that with our revenue, but we're not able to grow the local bus system and our projections. Transit way, where there is some major investment in transit ways, obviously, as you know. In the increased revenue scenario, this is where we can put the projects that are partially funded to also look at uh, things that have come through a planning process and reflect those in the plan and s talk about how a reasonable increase in transportation funding could uh, result in some of these major investments. It is not a wish list of projects as possibly what could reasonably be expected should there be changes in the transportation revenue based on maybe sales tax or gas tax or other changes and what that would buy. And this so you can communicate to the public uh, what are some of the needs for increased revenue. The timeline we're on, we're, this is a really good point for uh, an update to the city here as we're in the process where we're just starting the adoption process for the draft plan. Last week we took the first vote at TAC planning and that'll work its way through TAC, Transportation Advisory Committee at the council and then TAB and then it will be approved uh, this June for releasing for public comment uh, this summer. After those public comments are received in August, we'll take those comments and make changes to the plan with expected adoption in October. We thought it was important, is this plan has to be adopted by next, next March uh, to continue federal funding through the region, but we wanted to make sure that it's adopted with this current council, current uh, kind of framework before the election. So we're on that path to have that adoption. What are some general changes uh, to this plan versus the existing plan that was approved in 2015? Uh, we'll update for inflation, other assumptions. There's been some new revenue for highways. The last uh, legislative session passed some fairly significant transportation investment in highways and the plan will reflect that. Obviously the CTIP dissolution and the changes in the county sales tax has changed increased transit revenue in the region. So we'll reflect where that increase in growth is. Um, and then in the, since the last plan, there's been several major regional studies that have went through public process and the city has participated in many of those city staff. Those plans include uh, looking at our major arterials and which signals should be converted to interchanges, a new, another update of the MinPass plan, plan and the priorities for MinPass. CMSP4 is our smaller, lower cost highway projects, congestion management safety plan has been updated. We now have a truck highway corridor study and then transit corridor status updates since the last plan. All those plans have been completed and the results of those planning processes will be reflected in this plan. So now we'll talk about the different investment scenarios and I'll, as each of our staff comes up, they'll introduce them for the record. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Cole Henniker. I'm multimodal planning manager for the Met Council. So I'm gonna talk about transit before we move on to highways. Um, one of the things that we talked about in the plan is how our goals and our objectives for our long range plan tie out to the outcomes we expect when we're investing in a system. So this takes some key phrases from the goals and objectives that are in our plan and relates them to how we're trying to achieve things with transit. So it kind of gives you a sense for what the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Um, we wanna be efficient and cost effective. This is really important when you're investing public dollars um, and I think the second phrase here is really the most important, reliable, predictable, attractive, and safe service is, is one of our key uh, foundations for investing in transit. When we do that, we're trying to attract more riders by giving them access to jobs, also attracting businesses and residents to the region, making the region a more competitive region nationally by investing in transit. And then another important thing here is focusing growth in areas that integrates all modes. So our transit system is one way to influence how the region develops longer longer term. Um, and then we also support equity, uh, clean air, and, and health communities through these types of investments. And with that framework, uh, I do need to talk about the fiscal piece that, that Nick had alluded to. So he had, had told you that we have enough revenues to maintain the bus system, and that's where we stand based on the forecasted growth of those revenues. 
Um, we have very limited expansion dollars for, for the bus system, and that is primarily through the regional solicitation. Um, that's a competitive pot of funds that flows <laughs> through the TAC and TAB process that Kathleen mentioned. And so this is often a very competitive pot, um, and, and Councilmember Wright can speak to the idea of this being a very elaborate process for distributing funds every two years in the region. And this is where our main expansions for transit on the bus side have been in recent years. Um, the transitway funding is a little bit different picture. We do have some revenues available here, including, I would say, one of the most aggressive New Starts programs in the country. Um, we have four projects in the New Starts pipeline in this region, and a couple of more actually just close to being in the pipeline, uh, as you'll see in the plan once I get there. Um, one change for this plan was replacing the revenues um, with CTIB revenues with the county sales tax, and so that's a change in how the revenue was structured. It didn't necessarily uh, dramatically change the overall revenues, but there were some increases to revenues for the counties that did increase their sales tax. Um, one slide here in the bus system. In addition to that idea of not being able to expand, there's a number of discussions about how we maintain the system to maximize performance. So that's a key piece for how we talk about the transit system. Um, the map here on the right is one of the tools that we use, which actually shows you uh, transit market areas. They're areas that are based off of underlying demographic information that estimate the level of, of ridership or transit demand that we expect across the entire region. Um, one of the interesting things that I like to point out here, and this has actually been true for several iterations of the market areas, is um, if you look at the, the west metro coming out of Minneapolis, you can kind of almost see the southwest corridor emerge through St. Louis Park and Hopkins, and then even down into Eden Prairie. I mean, in Botno Corridor, you can actually see uh, the, the terminus of that up in Brooklyn Center and Brooklyn Park um, show up on this map as well. So you can almost see why some of those corridors were some of the most promising corridors, of course, in addition to the blue line and the green line that exists today. Um, another thing I'd note on this slide is we are trying to talk more about how technology is changing, how transit is delivered. So looking at on-demand services, things like shared mobility, and trying to talk about how there are opportunities for transit to utilize those technologies moving forward. We don't have anything yet that's really actively using those in this region, but we are exploring it and trying to figure out how it might fit in that picture. So here's kind of the, the coup de grace of the transit plan. The, the current revenue scenario is our investments in the transit system based on known revenues. Um, because there was a lot of the plan, previous plan focused on CTIB, there was a number of things that had to change as a result of that. Um, one note here, we updated the gold line, which is a, a corridor on the East Metro uh, that has a new alignment for that mode. I would say the biggest change to this map is that uh, Rush Line is a new corridor in the, in the region that has dedicated bus rapid transit out of downtown St. Paul to White Bear Lake. Uh, they went through an elaborate planning process and Ramsey County demonstrated that they have the revenues to, to be able to afford that project since so that was included in uh, this plan update. Uh, a project that isn't directly uh, related to Minneapolis, but the, the Riverview LPA is, is completed, almost completed with their process, but they weren't going to be done in time for this plan update. So we expect to address the Riverview Modern Streetcar project in a future plan update or amendment um, probably within the next two years. Um, another slight design tweak is we, we did change this map to focus less on the colors of the lines from the branding perspective and more on the status of the corridors, and that will be more apparent on the next map. Um, talking about ABRT, um, we, we have a pretty substantial success trying to get regional solicitation funds for arterial BRT build-out. So we actually have a number of corridors that have received some funding through that competitive process at the regional level. And so we, we acknowledge those corridors on this map, uh, primarily the D-Line, the B-Line, and the E-Line, which are Chicago, Lake, and Hennepin, are corridors that have some funding identified through the regional solicitation. Um, and we, what makes that unique is also those projects could be delivered in an incremental fashion in terms of building out certain segments at a time or delivering certain elements in advance of the entire BRT project. Um, and that is something that we, we would explore if we couldn't achieve more funding just to make improvements for those riders if, if uh, the full funding doesn't materialize. Um, the D-Line is, is a project that's the most important to the council on that list, and we are seeking a bonding request this year to try to fully fund that project. And given the timing of this plan, which we'll hear about later, if that is done by this session, we, we would be able to get that project in the fully funded plan before it's released for public comment. So we're really optimistic that's going to happen, and we have a plan in place to address that. 
For the increased revenue scenario, here's where you see the, the colorations kind of giving you a better sense of the status. Um, the lighter purple are most of the corridors that are added to the increased revenue scenario. Uh, the darker purple lines would be the ones that are that have some sort of planning recommendation out there, uh, whereas the lighter purple ones have not yet made a recommendation for the type of corridor to be invested in. Um, so there's some nuances there. I wanted to focus in particular, though, on Minneapolis here because it's, you know, the map is so congested in Minneapolis that we, we have to really focus it in here um, and talk about where some of the projects that the city has explored are, are, are at. Um, Nicollet Central is actually one of the only projects that we are calling a project in advanced development. So they actually have both an LPA recommendation and they're doing advanced um, environmental and design work. And so our plan puts that as really the top tier of the increased revenue scenario, a project that is that is identified some funding but not yet fully funded. Um, projects with study recommendations would include quarters like Midtown, which the PAC released an LPA recommendation in, in 2012, and then West Broadway, which actually just completed their recommendation in 2017 of a modern streetcar. Um, and then, as I had mentioned, there are, there are three arterial BRTs in the current revenue scenario that have partial funding. The remainder of the corridors are in our increased revenue scenario, um, and that we expect that we could build those if the region were to get a reasonable amount of additional revenue. Just for time, I'm going to skip this, but are there any questions about transit before we move on to the highways section? Councilmember Benner. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I have some basic questions I wanted to ask, and if you don't know the answer is it's not like a quiz. <laughs> I was curious um, what percentage of trips are either have their origin or destination in Minneapolis from the system's perspective? Uh, Chair Wright, Council Member Bender, that is a great question. I don't have that available, but we do have that information, so we can certainly share it with this group after the meeting. That'd be great. And I, I mean, I think the rest of my questions would, would probably also need follow-up, but I was just curious about, you know, the percentage of our population that's transit dependent. Um, and I think, you know, the point of the questions would be to underscore the value of our partnership with Metro Transit and how important it is to make sure that our transit system is invested in and serving our population because, um, you know, on the one hand, we have a, a large percentage of our population that is dependent on transit for one reason or another. And we have really aggressive goals about greenhouse gas emission reduction and um, supporting alternative modes of transportation, all of which are really supported by our transit system. So um, anyway, I think um, it, it makes sense that we're focused today on the uh, outlook to the future and the lines that we're building, but I think some of that basic information about um, our, the value of transit to our city, I know it's found in the in the plan documents, the existing plan documents, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. And I might add just maybe even expatiate on a very key component of the plan. Um, in the past, you know, equity meant sort of what we now would say would be regional balance of investment to having more of a socioeconomic uh, lens and to maybe expatiate on how that impacts decisions like transit, uh, congestion impacts, just to show how that lens um, is baked into the decisions uh, because that's, I think, a very new element and very consistent with how we are reframing uh, our policies here in the city. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I wanted to go back to this slide just to address the transit dependent. One of the factors that actually is one of the four factors that goes into developing this from a technical perspective is the number of transit dependent people in each census tract. So this gives you a sense that that is a huge factor in why Minneapolis shows up as such a transit rich uh, community. Um, and in terms of equity, I, I think, Mr. Chair, you're familiar with the, the regional solicitation trying to consider equity in a more socioeconomic perspective. Um, a number of the different factors that we look at when trying to determine how we might be able to invest in transit, uh, we always include equity as a, as a factor in the technical analysis, and we try to encourage our policymakers to also consider that when making decisions. Um, we can't always influence that just because of the way the decisions are made at a regional scale, um, but we certainly are value equity as the council, and, and maybe some of the other modes could touch on that as well. Thank you. Move on. Good morning, uh, Chair and committee members. My name is Tony Fisher. Uh, I just want to touch on three issues around highways in the region. Uh, so first up, uh, state uh, highway funding in the region. Historically, um, the state has spent about 43% of uh, dollars in the metro area. Uh, MnDOT has moved towards performance-based uh, planning for uh, pavement and bridge preservation. 
And given the number of miles and the number of bridges outside of the Twin Cities area, that draws money outside of the region. Um, we are um, expecting to meet those um, preservation targets over the next 10 years or so, but over the 20 year time frame, um, we start to see some deterioration in the condition of those assets. Um, so uh, in the currently adopted plan, uh, mobility funding was estimated to end in uh, 2023. Um, given the, the recent conversations around the, the draw of money outside of the metro region, um, there's been a new, um, MnDOT's made some new commitments towards mobility funding in the region, and those are um, $150 million, um, $50 million per year for over three years, um, and then a, 20 to $30 million through the life of the plan, through 2037, 2040, um, depending on how you look at it. Um, so the way that affects uh, the share of dollars to the region, you can see in uh, the green bar is really the next four years, and that's kind of in the range of um, historical averages. But uh, we were expecting the next six years to go to 36% with uh, recent changes that's brought up to 40%. And that really gives us the time to, to have these conversations around um, priorities for the state uh, highway system. And then in the longer term, that was gonna drop to 28% and that's brought up to 30%. Um, there's more time to have conversations around those years. So that seemed to be less consequential. Uh, Nick touched on some of the highway studies that are informing this update to the plan. Um, and then again, um, we are also updating uh, financial uh, forecasts for state, federal, um, and local dollars in the plan. Uh, MinPass is an important priority for the council in terms of uh, mobility, transit advantages, advantages to HOV vehicles. Um, and this is the proposed uh, prioritization for the region in the draft uh, TPP right now. And uh, Likewise, uh, highway truck corridors were prioritized in, a, in another study, and um, these were the priorities that came out of that study for um, corridors that are important to freight movement. So we are proposing to study a number of items for the, the next update to the TPP, and those include uh, system interchanges. Those are where two freeways cross, um, traditionally cloverleaf interchanges. Um, we might start to see flyover investments. We've got a number of areas, a uh, number of cities, um, seeking these kind of investments, and we're looking for a way to prioritize those. Um, the congestion management process is really looking to, to collect data on the A minor arterial system, kind of that second tier of highways in the region, um, and understand um, where congestion is um, and, and what solutions might address some of that. Uh, we are, like everybody, are, are interested in connected autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are a lot more questions and answers around that, so we do in, intend to study that. Um, over the next years. And then we wanna organize uh, truck counts better, just the different agencies collecting different data, try and um, have access to uh, each, each other's data. And then um, continue to keep an eye on new and emerging freight technologies. And then, um, you know, these are kind of the highlights, but we're also open to other ideas for study. Happy to answer any questions. Sure, any questions for this segment? Um, I guess I'll make one just based on the uh, the tiering. Just I'll just note, um, and maybe there's a comment that could be made in response. You know, if you have a tier one, which I believe is 35 north, um, and then it joins at 62 as it moves into Minneapolis, um, it seems as though if you're doing a bus study in one section that's away from the urban core, which is pretty much the predominant destination, is tier one. That last stretch when it merges with 62 is tier two. How it seems like the efficacy of the whole route really is dependent on that last stretch. Yeah, so a lot of our mobility investments are paired with preservation investments. And so uh, a lot of that decision making was around the timing of mm -hmm. those preservation investments. And uh, oh, thanks for that clarification. And also, um, you know, I know uh, a lot of the freight conversation happens in a more of an outstate or a, a bigger highway. So I'm encouraged to hear that the minor arterials where a lot of our commerce takes place in the cities. And we don't really have the room as a builder or environment. It's an obvious statement to make to have flyovers. You know, you knock out a beloved church or something like that to make room for an intersection uh, mobility. But in terms of those last mile, a lot of commerce happens. You know, we have, you know, intermodal, we have distribution centers. And oftentimes it's that last stretch, which is really critical and often complicated. And I guess the point is expensive. Yet, you know, how would, is there a rating system that actually accommodates for, for those dynamics? So in uh, MnDOT recently held a freight solicitation for um, funding awards. 
And uh, that was one of the three categories was that first last mile. No, oh, oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, another sort of central issue that we hear a lot about from constituents and um, as we look at our own planning for the future is the disproportionate impacts of air quality in neighborhoods in our city um, where we see concentrations of asthma and other air quality related health concerns. Is that um, air quality piece factoring into your highway system plans and can we work together to figure out how we are um, working together to solve kind of this historic racial equity issue in our city? Yeah, I think uh, the council and MnDOT are working through um, historical inequities and um, um, especially those caused by the transportation system. Um, air quality is one that's been raised. Uh, noise pollution is another. Um, that has a, probably a simpler solution in noise walls, um, but it, it's definitely part of the conversation. Thank you. See no further questions, thank you. Morning, Mr. Morning. Chair, committee members. I'm Steve Elmer, and uh, I do bike and pedestrian planning at Met Council. So I'm going to give you a, a brief um, background on the regional bicycle network and how we're proposing to update that with this transportation policy plan. Um, this is the um, the uh, existing regional bicycle transportation network uh, that was established in the last transportation policy plan uh, adopted in 2015. Uh, it's a a series of corridors and alignments and regional destinations uh, as shown here. And I'm gonna talk more about the corridors here, but the overall purpose of our RBTN is to um, establish a regional uh, background, backbone arterial network um, to serve daily bicycle uh, transportation needs uh, and to connect to and between regional destinations as well as, and maybe more importantly, to connect between local bicycle networks um, the corridors are uh, where specific alignments have yet to be designated, and we leave that, we give that flexibility uh, in the process for local jurisdictions to make um, those designations through local plans. Um, and uh, alignments are identified where we've had existing or planned uh, trails or on street bikeways or a combination of the two. Um, within uh, the corridors that initially came out. The other thing I, I forgot to mention was the network was based on a regional bicycle system study uh, that was a, over a one year process uh, in 2013, 2014. That's how these corridors came to be. Um, both of our um, corridors and alignments uh, were set up to meet a series of uh, regional guiding principles and those were established by a project advisory committee during that regional bike study. Uh, there are about a dozen of them. And uh, we also use those and refer to those uh, as we update with uh, potential new corridors and alignments in the plan. Uh, both, um, we have both tier one and tier two priority designations for corridors and alignments. Um, the purple uh, designations are tier ones and those have the uh, highest priority for regional planning and investment. Uh, there's, we do have regional trails as well, and uh, the RBTN is a transportation system. Um, within Minneapolis, I believe all the regional trails are designated as RBTN alignments uh, because they connect so well between uh, major destinations. Uh, but overall, uh, the RBTN, the first and foremost importance is transportation. Uh, and for regional trails, the first and foremost planning principle is uh, our recreation. That's the focus. We are connecting between primary um, our regional destinations uh, on the RBTN and with the, uh, the regional parks plan uh, from our regional parks policy plan, we're connecting to and between regional parks and regional trails. Uh, the other major characteristic difference um, of how we look at the RBTN is the directness of the route is highly valued and valued over aesthetics, where when we're planning regional trails, aesthetics may be the most important uh, factor. Um, uh, this, this shows the regional uh, changes, the additions um, to the plan uh, for this version. We had a series of meetings in um, 2017. Uh, with counties and major cities 
um, to talk about potential additions and potential changes. This map shows um, alignment designations where we had a corridor, and so those are just the solid um, purple lines uh, shown on here. Um, and then we have new uh, tier uh, alignments and corridors uh, shown, highlighted with uh, the yellow uh, around the purple and green. Uh, and so this is this is what we came up with uh, through the process in uh, meeting with your your uh, city planning folks, and uh, we also had a discussion with our with your uh, bicycle advisory committee as well. Uh, and then overall, uh, this is what the new proposed network will look like with the additions uh, for the seven county region, uh, showing again the alignments and the corridors. So I will. Stop here and turn it back to you for any questions on this. Any questions for this segment of the presentation, Councilmember Bender? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This might be a question or more of an observation, but I think we're seeing um, in our city and maybe other communities are as well a uh, situation where we have a arterial corridor that is both on our bicycle master plan as well as our um, rapid transit network plan. So we're trying to put arterial BRT or a better bus line on a route that also is designated in our bike master plans. And um, I think right now we're taking those case by case and sometimes this body has made the decision not to move our bicycle facility to a different corridor, um, which may or may not have the same kind of quality of bicycle access as the arterial did. Um, and then there are corridors coming up like Hennepin Avenue in my ward where I think we're grappling with that. So I don't know if you have any comments to make about how as a region we're trying to figure out how we can get but all of these systems built out, um, and you know, so how are you working with localities on that issue? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Bender. And uh, yeah, we're we're working with uh, the cities and counties, and we would address um, changes as they're proposed, I guess, um, and uh, review them on a case by case basis. The regional system is um, again meant to connect to and between our regional destinations, so not every local corridor will be a original facility. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Chair, Council Members, that concludes our general presentation, but we'd be happy to take any other questions, and thank you for this opportunity. And again, there'll be some more opportunities coming up, but we wanted to give you a general update at this point before we release a draft. Oh, very good. Um, Council Member Gordon. I guess I had a little question or just something I wanted to, to bring up a little bit and it relates to when we were talking about the highways and the interstates and I'm wondering if there's been any planning or discussion going into maybe how, how we want to um, uh, downsize that a little bit. I think there's clearly some ramps in the metropolitan area and if you look back historically how much land was taken for the highways from the city. Um, and there's un underutilized land. We're right now trying to plan for, for our future and where we're going to have enough housing and enough jobs available to us. Um, you look at downtown and there's some ramps coming in from 94 that seem to fly over the buildings along their second floor before they actually get to downtown. And I know some cities have looked at doing things of like removing some of those ramps into their downtown areas. Um, tightening up some cloverleaf formations that might be in the middle of the city and even decking over their highways. Has there been any um, discussion about that in, in the planning? I, I can point to probably the, the most advanced discussion in something like that is with the Rethinking I-94 corridor study, where it's really taking a different planning approach. Uh, MnDOT has stated they in, identified that you really need that infrastructure there is at its at li end of life and needs to be rebuilt. And so as they're re developing the reconstruction of that, completely rethinking the planning for that highway. And ideas, like you mentioned, have come up in discussion. Um, and how that highway interstate, which is critically important to the region and the state, can fit better within the community. So that's an example of a corridor that is being looked at very differently from a planning perspective. And then on a very case-by-case -case basis, there are always looking for opportunities where, you know, if there's unnecessary infrastructure as it's being replaced, not replace it. Um, it's been an investment policy for a long time that if there's expansion, first and foremost, you try to do it within the right way that you have. So the design standards have been changing to really fit as much in it without impacting the existing built environment. So 
some of those are some examples of that, how it's reflected in the plan. Well, I would say from my perspective, anything that you can put in your transportation policy plans moving forward that would tee up um, support, openness, um, a desire to see some of those things happen um, would really help, I think, in our efforts in terms of how we want to make sure that our city works well for folks here as well as for those um, people who are passing through it. Um, so, because uh, I, I, I think there could be some, some synergy to maybe make some, some progress. And as you pointed out, that is things that uh, the Department of Transportation is already looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of higher level questions. One was that I was looking through the land use um, section of the plan. And of course, all of us are updating our own comprehensive plans. The city of Minneapolis is, you may have read in the newspaper or on Twitter, um, considering some, some big moves in how we're looking at transit oriented development and allowing for more housing near transit lines. And of course, we're already developed city with a lot of residential density in our traditional transit oriented, the original transit oriented neighborhoods. Uh, could you talk about how this plan encourages transit oriented development near transit? Um, I know that as a regional organization, you're in a difficult position where localities don't want you to sort of butt into our business. But I think we all feel it's really important that our transit investments as a region are supported by the kind of housing near transit that leads to ridership um, through its density, through its parking requirements, through its levels of affordability. Um, so and I, I think this plan talks about that. Yeah, I can touch on highly and Cole can add anything. If there's, I mean, as we make our major transitway investments, transit oriented development is one of the key drivers of making those successful. Uh, we know we talk a lot about, about the land, how good land use principles can reflect in better, result in better ridership. Um, um, and attract riders to transit. And then we definitely are encouraging uh, transit-oriented development along all the transit ways investments because uh, it's both demanded by the citizens, but also makes that whole network operate so much better. Uh, so that's at a high level. We talk about it a lot in the plan. I don't know if there's anything else you'd add, Cole. Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest changes Three, three, four years ago when we did this plan update was including density requirements near transit station areas. And so we're just starting to put that into practice. Obviously with all these cities going through comp plan updates right now, this will be our first time to assess how we're doing in that, in that realm. Um, but one of the things I remember hearing a uh, particular politician speak about is that our plan really goes to TOD 2.0. Some of the cities that are experiencing this for the first time, and this is not Minneapolis, but they're, they need to even just start talking about TOD first in order to get their community comfortable with it and then start assessing where it could be applied in their community. So, you know, there's always these different scales of where we're at depending on the city you're in. And so, you know, we actually often look to cities like Minneapolis or St. Paul to lead the region and allow us to take examples from them and apply them to other cities. Our plan does speak a lot about the importance of TOD though, for sure. And then of course we have programs like LCDA where we have transit-oriented development grants available to help developers um, prep land for, for more dense development. And within that, we, we do set certain requirements for those types of grants. I think that's really important, and I appreciated seeing that density requirement in the land use plan. I think, I mean, it's a big deal. I know it's a difficult conversation, but one, if we want our transit system to function and function well and serve the people that really need transit, I think we need to incorporate that land use and transportation element together. I also wondered, um, and I know this is a sensitive topic too, but um, in terms of your sustainability for funding our transit system, you know, I'm not sure that, especially the regular person in Minneapolis knows where you get your funding. And I particularly wanted to ask if your um, funding scenarios are still assuming that the regional sales tax for transit is is kind of going to the same places it used to be when CTAB was, was in charge, or if we know where Hennepin County is at in terms of their, um, how they'll be allocating those funds. Sure, uh, that's a great question because that is one of the major changes. Uh, what we've done is that the plan will reflect after discussions with each of the CTIP counties and when they dissolve, they, it became their decision how they would allocate that funding. We know in Ramsey and Hennepin County, they have indicated that they would like the plan to reflect that all the sales tax goes to transit investments in their counties. Uh, Anoka, Scott or Anoka, Dakota, and Washington are 
uh, have a varying different degrees of some of their uh, sales tax will go to highway investments and some to transit. So we're reflecting in the plan the input that we've received from each of the counties individually. And then our other major transit funding source, the state is a major funding source for general funds. That's worth somewhat from the local bus, but uh, mostly for Metro mobility. Uh, and so we make some assumptions about that state growth will continue to grow to meet those demands. And then the motor vehicle sales tax is a key instrument for funding transit in this region. And so uh, we have our assumptions about how that will grow. And we're hoping that continues to be a robust funding source, but um, you know, there's different scenarios on that. So the plan itself really does get into quite a bit of detail about the different funding sources for transit and what the assumptions are going forward. And then we continue to monitor to see if those assumptions are, bearing, are coming true in terms of su supporting the investment in the plan. I'll just add a comment then that I, we, I, we appreciate so much the ways that you are balancing that and working with a very limited amount of dedicated funding for transit in our region and sort of cobbling together funds to try to build out our system. And we really appreciate all the work that goes into all of that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Uh, well, thank you for this presentation. Um, I just want to echo, I think the work that's moving forward in the current plan is so much more reflective of where the city of Minneapolis is and probably St. Paul as well, not to speak for them. But, uh, and knowing that you know, growing pains of, in terms of policy shifts are very real and very political as well. And uh, the fact that staff uh, is mindful of that and we, as we navigate uh, the implementation of our ideas, goals, and plans, I think uh, is, is, is no small task. And uh, I think we should recognize the accomplishment to date to move that in that direction. And I think this plan, um, you know, minor details aside, uh, is certainly has the right compass. So thank you. We appreciate the comments and the opportunity to present today. Thank you. With that, I will uh, move um, to receive and file this report that we received today from our partners at Metro uh, Metropolitan Council. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Dissenting nay. That carries. And we are adjourned.